the feast of your heroes, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors. Make us worthy to celebrate the feast of the three blessed Masapki martyrs, Francis, Abdul Moti, and Raphael, who gave their lives because of their faith in you. May their blessed memory be eternal in your sight and grant us mercy and forgiveness through their holy prayers, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. the martyr who shed his blood and who quenched the thirst of the holy martyrs, to the one who strengthens the faithful, who crowns those who persevere and rejoices in their feast. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Christ our God, the martyrs endured great suffering and bitter persecution because of their love for you and their trust in your mercy. They won crowns of victory, making their relic sources of grace, healing and blessings. Today we honor the three Misapki martyrs known for their piety, goodness, and genuine concern for the poor and the needy. And we celebrate their feasts with spiritual hymns and good works. Now, O Lord, we ask you through the prayers and the intercession of your three beloved martyrs and with the fragrance of this incense to strengthen us in our daily struggles. Forgive our sins and grant us your grace. Have mercy on those who have faith in you and lead all peoples to you. May we walk on your path in the light of your gospel, keeping your commandments and following in the footsteps of your holy martyrs, that we may receive their crown in your eternal dwellings. With them we raise glory, thanks, and adoration to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Oh Lord, may the sweet fragrance of the relics of the martyrs intercede for sinners and for those who have gone astray, for the sick and the distressed, and for peace and harmony within your holy church and throughout the whole world. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Amen. sisters. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. Consider how he endured such opposition from sinners in order that you may not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You have also forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons. My son, do not disdain the, dis the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, in which all have shared, you are not sons, but bastards. Besides this, we have had our earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not then submit all the more to the Father of the spirits and live? Praise be to God always.
For the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two small coins? And yet, not one of them has escaped the notice of God. Even the very hairs of your head have all been counted, so do not be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others the Son of Man shall acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others shall be denied before the angels of God. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. For giving us his words of life, praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So what is our position in society, our status? Usually when we say status in English today, we mean a person's financial disposition. But status, the word itself from stare in Latin, it actually means your position, where you are established, status, your standing, your place in society. And these questions are major questions. They lead to wars, actually. It was a question that was asked in the 19th century. What is the status in slavery? Legal, constitutional, all these arguments were made all the time. And then a number of people that you know as abolitionists finally said, forget about all these legal ramifications and arguments. Is this moral? Is this acceptable to own other people? It didn't have to do with race. And we change everything these days, manipulate everything, call abortion women's health care, and call slavery racism. But slavery is a question of status and econ economical questions. It involves certain races, but you have free black slaves in the South who owned other African slaves. It's a much more profound question unless we stop and ask what is really being asked instead of trying to re reduce them to simplified cliches. We never actually solve the problem. And so, when we talk about the question of well, what is a baby? What is the question of abortion? What is the status of a human being before they leave the womb? That's what we're really arguing over. The same way that you could have free black men own African slaves in Louisiana, for example, at the same time, and no one else really cared. White owners, black owners, didn't matter. Cherokee owners, the Indians owned slaves too. The economic questions. But it's till they turn the question around and say, but what does it actually mean to be owned as a piece of property? Is this moral? 
What is the status of these individuals? Then all of a sudden, once we discuss it as being a moral question, then it explodes. If we argue only about legal niceties. And so you live in a state now, state meaning the country, a state in time, in which the question really becomes of a human being of what is their status before they leave the womb? You're asking the same moral questions that were being asked in the 1830s and the 1840s and the 1850s, which led up to a civil war among the states. But it really is a question of morality of what are these people in our society? Now, this is not really what the sermon's about today. It is about the Masakis. But what takes place in the 1850s, the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire, is going through huge remodelings, if you want, in the 19th century, like many places, like the United States of America. And these things become explosive because you're asking questions not about what's the law of the Sultan, but you're asking questions about what are these people? Who are they? And what takes place in the 1850s is the Ottoman Empire begins to lift some of the laws that were oppressive to the Christian populations. And one of them being jizya, this poll tax. So from the beginning in Islam, <clears throat> if you're not a Muslim and you live in a Muslim society, or at least a society that is governed by Muslims, if you are a pagan, you have a choice. You will either embrace the law of God in the Quran, or you die. But you have other people like Jews and Christians, and in Persia, the Zoroastrians, but that's a whole other question, who were referred to as being people of the book. They were allowed to live, but you had to pay protection money. And literally, you were being protected. Dimi, dimitude we call it in English. So you have a status in the Islamic society, but you're not a full citizen. There's something wrong with you because you, you, you believe in corrupted gospels. You adhere to the law of Moses and its corruption. You can live because you're part of the history of God's revelation, more or less, but not its fullness because you reject the true teachings through Muhammad. But you'll be allowed to live, but you will pay a poll tax for your status. Now, in any kind of society, it's like when you ask this question, I don't know about you when you did social studies or history and even in elementary school, and the question always became, well, you know, not many people could afford to buy slaves any more than many of us can have a whole fleet of cars. So the question became, what about all those poor white people who lived in the South? Why did they become so intense about slavery? It didn't benefit them in any way, except it did socially. Because in a society, no matter how poor I am, if there's still a more disparaged, lesser rank socially, I'm cool with that. And so even if I am a penniless, white individual living in the backwoods of the Appalachians, I know there are people who live in bondage. So they're beneath me socially, so my status isn't that bad. When you start to remove these things, you agitate the whole social structure which isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just what happens. And so in 1856, when these taxes and these restrictions upon the Christian population were being removed, it aggravated many, many, many Muslims. Because at this point, you had rich Christians living in the Ottoman Empire. The Masapkis being case in point. Francis Masapki is the oldest of the three brothers. He's 70 in 1860. His family, and he is Jiddu, he is the patriarch. They live together, his family is there. His brother Abdul Modi is also a married man with children. Raphael, the youngest of the three, um, was, was not married. But they live in this family. They have been living in Damascus for many centuries. 
at least six by that point. Their name probably comes from an area where the family lived in earlier times. And they made money as silk traders. Francis was known as being a man of such integrity that even the Muslim merchants would confide business when they knew he was traveling someplace to do business. He was so well known that many times in the villages when it was known that he was coming, they would begin to ring the bells in the churches. So they could come out to greet this man who showed mercy and compassion to the poor and who was wealthy, but used that wealth for the kingdom of God. That's why you have reference in the Husoyo today to their acts of mercy and kindness to the needy and to the poor. And this is part of the story because this capital sin that we call envy, and people usually just translate as sloth, and sloth often in English today means laziness. That's not what envy is. That's not the capital sin. Lazy, being lazy is just being lazy. We're neglecting our duty of state. We're neglecting the things we should be doing. That's just laziness. Sloth is different. Or excuse me, envy is different. Envy as a capital sin is the source of a jealousy. That's why, excuse me, it's too early in the morning. Envy and laziness and sloth. All right, let's un disentangle this again. I did this once actually with a sermon on the, um, the profession of St. Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Totally boggled up the whole thing and for the whole sermon then realized that I was just totally wrong. All right, let's go back to envy. Envy is often called jealousy. There we go. But jealousy is not the same thing. I derailed onto another sermon for envy, for sloth and laziness. All right, so envy and jealousy. Jealousy is I resent the goods of other people just because I'd like to have the stuff. It's a nice car. I like their pool. Nice house. It just kind of bothers me because I would like to have this. Envy is much more pernicious. Envy is when we resent someone else's goods because we think it makes us look worse. That's why it's a capital sin. It is a source. These capital sins don't mean they're the worst sins. It means that they are the fountainhead and the origin of all the other sins. They are the kaput. They are the head. And so envy, envy is when I resent the good of other people because I think it makes me look worse. It's the high school kids who always bumble around and these guys, are, they're fine. We all get C's, that's okay. And then one of the guys is like, well, this is ridiculous. This semester I can at least get a B in this class. And so he studies a little bit more and he pulls a B. And the other guys are totally ticked off. We're gonna razz you, we're gonna make fun of you, or your teacher's pet, you know. But what you're actually doing is they still got the same C's that they've always had. They have the exact same grade they've always had. But now they resent this B of their buddy because they think it makes their C looks worse, which if comparatively speaking, it does. But they're exactly in the same status they were before. That's envy. Envy is when I resent your goods because I think it makes me look worse. I resent the pool, not because I want a pool, too much cleaning, too much cost, but I resent it because your yard looks better and is attractive. And so it makes my yard, I think, look worse. Though my yard is exactly the way it was six months ago before you put in your pool. But envy means I resent your good because I think it makes me look worse. It's why little children in third grade beat up the kid who just got the A on the spelling bee. Because they resent it because they think. It's why, why co-education doesn't work well. Because it's why the little boys in fifth grade who resent the girls because they're all smarter than them anyways in fifth grade, and they're answering all the questions, smarty pants in the classrooms. And so when they get out to recess, well, the boys are still bigger than them in fifth grade, so they can knock them in the gravel. This is why you get these things, because of envy. It's a very human sentiment, and one that, of course, we have to work at developing virtue.
So when these laws are lifted on the status of Christians, you have a lot of Muslims who are now furious because they think it makes their status look worse. And many Muslims, of course, are poor. So now all of a sudden there's no longer social legal restraints on Christians. And some of them are wealthy, they're landowners. In the mountains of the Lebanon, it's a battle between the Maronites and the Druze as it begins. Druze, you have to go Google and look up. It's a form of Islam, it's very strange. It's probably a mishmash of Gnosticism from the old Midi, uh, Middle Eastern Gnosticism and Islam. And it's just straightforward Sunni Muslims and the Christians in the Syrian plains. And from 1859, so 1856, 18, the Ottoman Empire in this area begins to explode. In 1859, 1860, this thing moves from the Lebanon into the anti-Lebanon and down to the plains of Syria and arrives in July of 1860 in Damascus. And these men who have always held in a very noteworthy position within society, their family, have always been very close to the Franciscans. And so if you go to Damascus to this day, the Franciscan church is directly across the street from the Maronite Cathedral. Still, they're both, they both date since 1860 because in 1860 at that night, they were both burned down. But the Franciscans were very close, excuse me, the, the Masapkis were very close to the Franciscan friars. And you've seen these things on CNN. You do the sermons, at the mosque on Fridays, and then we finish our prayers and we go out and we start ransacking a neighborhood. You saw that for years in Iraq, because that's the social communication in the mosque. And what you would do is beforehand, you would go around to the buildings and you would mark them with a white cross, or you'd mark them with an Arabic N, Nun, which looks kind of like a little curve and a dot on top. And you put these on the building so everyone knew where to go on the businesses. Churches were obvious, but on the businesses and the houses. And then they would go out and it became this orgy and frenzy of burning. And they began with the Greek Orthodox because the Greek Orthodox were the poorest, the poorest Christians in the Christian quarter. In the Christian quarter of Damascus and the Muslim quarter inside the medieval walls, the neighborhoods themselves were separated. So there were gates between each of the neighborhood and every night the gates of the city would be closed to protect the city, but then in between the neighborhoods the gates were also closed. And on July 10th when they came filing out, not filing, when they came flowing out, surging out of the mosque around Damascus, the first thing they did was they closed the gates so that those in the Christian quarter you couldn't get out. And then they began with the Greek Orthodox Church because they were the poorest and therefore are not going to be heavily armed. And they began by burning down their church. And so the Masapkis went, these brothers who were always very concerned for the needy and the indigent and the poor, they went to see the Franciscan friars to see if they needed help. And when they arrived there, they basically became locked into the church, which became a place of refuge for many people. When I asked our, our, the Maronite Archbishop in Damascus, I said, how did they know so much about this story that night? He says, because that night the children, the children were actually behind the altar. And so they watched these men being killed, cut down, having their throats slit in the church on that night, in the middle of the night. And those little children were the ones who gave testimony decades later during the investigation as to the martyrdom. So the status being upturned in the 1850s leads to this envy and this fury. And what the, Fran what the Franciscans do, they have, what takes place in the middle of the night is the Muslims get in because one of the hired hands who was a Muslim let them in. And they confront the friars and they say, we want to have the treasure. You give us your stuff. And so the guardian of the house, the superior, the Franciscan superior, takes them upstairs. He takes them into the friary. And they go into a chapel. They go into a room. The Muslims are with them. And he's up at the altar doing something. And what the guardian is actually doing is consuming the Blessed Sacrament to make sure that it is not blasphemed 
and misused. And when they realize there's nothing in there except this one, one cup, that's it. And he says, but this is the treasure. And they become so enraged, they slit his throat and kill him on the altar in the chapel. First one down. That night there will be five Franciscans who will be martyred also along with the three brothers. And when the brothers go back down to the church, it's when they're confronted with Francis and then Abdul Moti in the church. And Raphael has always been praying in front of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So if you look on the front of the bulletin, you see that what the painting is representing, the one who's kneeling down in front of the altar, is the brother Raphael. And when Francis is confronted by these men, he knows them and they know him. And he tells them, if Sheikh so-and-so needs to keep the money that I lent him, he can keep it. And they're like, that's not what this is about. And they force upon him to renounce Christianity so that he can live. And he tells them, I was born a Maronite Catholic and I will not renounce our Lord. And so in that protestation of his faith, they kill him at the entranceway of the church. And his brother, the same thing, is confronted with the profession. They're attacking as much of them as their family, as who they are as Christians. But it becomes the crux of the matter is not because you're wealthy, but it's because you're Christian this night and this is what we hate in you. And so their profession of the faith, so Raphael, who's been praying at the other side of the church in front of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he's watched his two brothers be cut down and when they come to Raphael and he stands up and they confront him with the same questions that you will embrace Islam, he doesn't even answer the question. He simply turns from them, kneels back down in front of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in that rejection of their confrontation, they become so enraged, they slit his throat, they kill him, and they stomp on his body in front of the Mother of God. This profession of the Masapki brothers is profoundly important for us to know who they are. First of all, because they're laymen. These are not the friars, these are not religious, these are not priests. These are laymen who show the attachment, the profound attachment to the faith. And these laymen who are still enshrined, their bones are still enshrined in the Maronite Cathedral in Damascus give us also this understanding of what happens when status is upheaval that takes place in society. Status is a very important and central question. But what is more important is the profession of the faith, not legalities, not constitutionality, but what is true and what is good and what is supernatural and what is the grace of illumination that is given to us in faith. So on this day, the choosing of this idea that we have a cloud of witnesses before us who show us a path. The Masapkis in the 1860s, you don't know these stories because we were preoccupied by killing each other by 1860, 1861, already cudgeling each other in the, in the Congress building a decade beforehand. The 19th century is not a happy period. The 20th century, even less happy. We just seem to keep going downhill for the last 200 years in rather dramatic ways. And it's important to be aware of those things. But be even more important to be aware of the heroes and the heroines who have lived in these times and who showed us a path. And the children who will be born in the year 2137, they look to you to be faithful, to be strong, and to be attached to our Lord in charity and in true faith, so that they might have the possibility of the faith later on. The Masapkis, the Masapki family still exist. You go to Lebanon, you go around Syria, you'll see Masapki hotels, you'll see the name. The family is still around. But it's defense in 1860 that gives you the possibility to have the luxury to assemble in the divine Corbono here in central Maine. Because people before us showed that heroic faith and to hold true to the faith and to defend the faith and if necessary in that defense to die, whether well, that is still glorious. 
and they themselves become part of that cloud of witnesses. So may each one of us be invited at some point to join that cloud, that glorious cloud of witnesses who have gone before us and whom we hopefully shall be witnesses to the generations after us through fidelity, through faith, through charity, and through a profound hope that sees the hand of God in all things. And so may the prayers of the Masapkis attain for us these things and be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her child, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and the Blessed Mesopkis, Francis, Amdel, Moti, and Raphael. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen. We praise and glory and honor in the most of the Trinity. Bring us in the saints. Could you listen? Alleluia. Continue with the Anaphora of St. John Marin on page 897. 897. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Good and holy God and Father, through your only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have prepared this spiritual and holy banquet for us. Accept these pure offerings and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to approach your sanctuary with pure hearts and clear consciences. Grant us the peace that your only Son gave to his holy disciples, so that we may give one another the same peace with a holy kiss. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, o holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God.
peace and security and your love, grace and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. before you and ask that your merciful right hand rest upon your servants who are here before your majesty. Mark us with a sign of life that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Lord of creation, Lord of the universe, unsearchable God, you are the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, born of you and equal to you. He is the radiance of your glory, the image of your being, and by your power, the maker of all. In him you created the world in your grace. In him we see you, and from him we receive your spirit. In him the mystery of the Trinity, hidden from all ages, was revealed. We praise and thank you with our mouths that have been blessed by your word and cleansed with your forgiving his soul. Those who glorify you are countless. Cherubim and seraphim, thousands of spiritual beings standing before you, and myriads of fiery ranks serving your majesty. They sing triumphant hymns with harmonious voices. O Lord, although we are your weak and sinful children, make us worthy through the gift of your grace to sing with them and to proclaim. Glory to you, God the Father. We have exalted our human nature through the cross. We have never done that person in the center of the love of the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord. He came down to us, and by the Holy Spirit, He came to us, accomplishing all things for our salvation.
Do this in memory of me, for whenever you gather in my name and eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. suffered and endured for us, and your liberating and life-giving plan of salvation, your miraculous incarnation, your saving passion, your life-giving cross, and your life-giving death, your solemn burial, your joyous resurrection, your ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of the Father, on your second coming when you shall reward all people according to their deeds. O Lord, have compassion and pour out your mercy upon all of us, that we may enjoy the gifts of your heavenly church. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, sinful children, receive your graces. We thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. We Manin monio, anin monio, anin monio, nite moro rojo jayo kodisho, ona genda la inu al kurbono uno. Through these holy mysteries, may sinners be absolved and enemies be reconciled. May those who hate find peace, and those who are sad find joy. May those who grieve be consoled, and those who are sick be healed. May those in distress find comfort, and those who repent be humbled. May the prophets be remembered, the apostles honored, and all the martyrs crowned. And may the confessors exalt, and all the angels rejoice. May your divinity be praised and your trinity be honored, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this is sacrifice, the memorial of your passion, crucifixion, death, and resurrection for your church throughout the world. She is founded upon your hope, remembers your salvation, and awaits your kingdom. We offer it for the bishops of the true faith. Grant them the wisdom and knowledge that comes from you and make them worthy to proclaim your kingdom, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. May all the shepherds of the church sanctify their days by caring in fear and in justice for your people that you have entrusted to them, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the priests and deacons here and everywhere who serve diligently and are vigilant over their flocks. May they receive their reward. Remember those who have taken vows of chastity and holiness, who keep their bodies and thoughts pure, that they may triumph in their efforts. 
we pray to you, Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, our civil leaders who love you and all those whom you wish to govern us. Strengthen and assist them so that we may live in peace under their leadership. Crown them with true faith and good works. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O Lord, the children of the church, redeemed by your passion and given life by your death, for they share in your resurrection, those who are far and those who are near, those who are weak and those who are strong. Remember those who have presented these offerings upon your holy altar and accept them on your heavenly altar. Hear their just requests, and in exchange for their earthly gifts, grant them the gifts of heaven. We pray to you, Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, in your grace, those whom we have remembered and those whom we have not, in your mercy, <coughs> have compassion on them. Remember especially those in distress who experience hardships, the poor, the weak, and the grieving those in exile, captives and prisoners, the oppressed, outcasts, and the dejected, orphans and widows. Remember those bound by the chains of sin and subjected to various passions. Through your body and blood, may their sins be forgiven, their faults be pardoned, their weaknesses be cured, and their wounds be healed. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, in your great mercy, our fathers and patriarchs, the teachers of your holy church who are pleasing to you from the beginning. By the glorious light of their teachings, they brought people back from the darkness of ignorance to the true light of the holy gospel, and they fought to preserve the integrity of the true faith. Through their holy prayers, grant peace to your churches, monasteries, and convents, and put an end to wars and strife throughout the world. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all your saints, especially Mary, the holy and ever virgin mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and all who profess the Trinity in one true faith, through their holy prayers and petitions, look upon us with eyes of compassion and may your calming and pleasant face shine upon us. Make us worthy to share in their reward and in their inheritance, and may their shadow be a shelter of protection for us on the fearful day of judgment. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. O oh Lord, in the sweetness of your compassion, receive the souls of our brothers and sisters, the children of baptism, who have gone to you in the true faith from this world of darkness, especially for those for whom this sacrifice is offered. May the mystery of your body and blood be a pledge of life for them, a fire that consumes all sins and a burning coal that destroys transgressions. In your mercy grant them rest in the dwellings of light and joy in the heavenly Jerusalem. O lover of all people, grant us life, abundant blessings and mercy, and forgive our sins and theirs. Do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions hidden in sin, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Lord, and you are the pleasing oblation. Who offered your Son for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice. Who offered your Son to you the Lord. You are the high priest who offered your Son as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise as the incense, which we offer to our Father through you, to you in glory. O Lord, adorn our souls with your truth and sanctify us by your holy gifts. May you dwell among us that we may be secure. May your peace live within our hearts, your faith abide in our consciences, and your cross be a true sign of protection for your church. May our tongues proclaim your truth and repeat your holy prayer and our lips pour forth glorious thanks to you, that with you we dare to call the Father Abba, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Amen. O Lord, do not lead us, your lowly children, into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Shlomo el O Lord, we have approached your holy altar, the source of divine gifts. May we share in your holy mysteries and join the assembly of those who glorify you, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the whole most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified May our communion be <coughs> for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. <coughs> o Lord our God, to you be glory forever. <laughs>
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, O God, Father of great mercy, and we praise and glorify you for having made us worthy of your holy banquet and of sharing in your life-giving mysteries. We implore you, do not condemn us on that fearful day, but deliver us from all shame and disgrace, 
so that we may join in the assembly of your saints, that with them and among them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el O Christ, the King of glory, we entrust our lives to you, knowing that you will care for our needs. Help the elderly with your mighty power. Restrain the young with your guidance. Nurture children and instruct them in your divine teaching. And sign each of us with your victorious cross. To you be glory with your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.